Welcome to the Learning Shared Podcast. Hello, my name is Alan Wood and I'm your host. Thanks very much for listening. So Learning Shared is a space for anyone with an interest in supporting the needs of vulnerable learners in our society, including those with special educational needs and disabilities. We'll be hearing from and talking with a wide range of colleagues and stakeholders, including teachers, specialist practitioners, school leaders, researchers, as well as parents and carers. We'll be sharing creative, inspiring ideas, effective practice and things they've learned along their journey. With that in mind, please get in touch if you'd like to suggest a topic for a future episode or if you'd like to be involved in any way. You can visit us at www.learningshared.org or tweet us at underscore learning shared. The Learning Shared podcast is brought to you by Evidence for Learning and the EFL Send community. This is a growing community of teachers, practitioners, school leaders, researchers and academics that support children, young people and adults with special educational needs and disabilities or indeed any form of additional learning needs. You can find out more about the EFL Send community and Evidence for Learning at www.evidenceforlearning.net. I hope you enjoy this episode. Hello, we're joined for this episode by members of the senior leadership at Cabot Learning Federation. This is a multi-academy trust comprising more than 20 schools, serving children and young people aged 3 to 19. The team from CLF shared with us a brilliant presentation. It's, it's both rich and thorough, packed full of practical advice and powerful ideas. I say this because if you're listening to the audio-only version of this episode, there's a link to a video of the presentation on the Recovery Curriculum website at www.recoverycurriculum.org and If you select episode 10, you'll be able to watch and listen to the slideshow. So, Professor Barry Carpenter introduces colleagues from Cabot Learning Federation. Welcome to another in the Recovery Curriculum podcast series. Today, it's my very great pleasure to welcome members of the senior leadership of the Cabot Learning Federation. Cabot Learning Federation is based in the Southwest uh, and has grown over many years to the wide range of schools that are now included in that federation. We will have five members of the uh, senior team speaking to us during this presentation, each giving a rich perspective on the work that they have been doing because Cabot has taken the mission and purpose of recovery curriculum and as was intended, have made it their own, have developed their own personalised response to the varied and diverse populations that there are in that community of of schools that form the Learning Federation. We are led this morning by um, Sally Apps, who is the Executive Principal for the wider Cabot Federation. And then we will hear from Susie Weaver, who is the Executive uh, Principal uh, across the Trust, Helen Angel, who is Director of School Improvement. Charlotte Black, who is the Assistant Principal for Walls Court Farm Academy. And Karina Smith, who's Acting Vice Principal at Broad Oak Academy. And he's also a Teach First Ambassador. And when I read that biography, I was reminded that just this week, Prince Charles, who is patron of the the, uh, Teach First, uh, has actually spoken about how crucial teachers and schools are going to be uh, in the process of recovery. He said that they're actually key to the recovery of our children. And with that in mind, I'd now like to hand over to the Cabot Learning Federation team to speak to their approach to recovery. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Our trust is um, underpinned by a a number of core values, um, the heart values, and our mission is uh, very simply empowering learning. Um, Our mission is to consistently deliver excellent education experiences for pupils from 3 to 19, improving their life chances and serving the communities of which we're a part. 
And with those, that it works through uh, our heart values of high expectations, equity, all children, resilience and tolerance. And our interpretation and our, um, our use of recovery is underpinned entirely by these values. So to begin with, we're going to think about our curriculum in the context of our work at subject level. So our curriculum, as Sarah's described, definitely comes from our heart values. We seek equity for all of our children and we root everything we do in the wider purpose of education. But one of the things we really realise is we're only part of a child's journey. And so when we talk about through the eyes of a child, which is a really, really important phrase for us, we have to remember that actually only a child remembers what their education is like and knows what it's like in every different phase. And we try to exploit that as a three to 19 trust. So we use our expertise and our experiences with all of our colleagues across and throughout. And we keep that in mind and keep using the phrase through the eyes of a child whenever we plan, write, train, enact and quality assure. So we really think about all the time, how exactly is our curriculum benefiting our children and what does it look like to them and what experiences do they have? And of course, we always seek joy-filled learning. This is a key image for us. When we talk about the aim of our curriculum, we found it really, really helpful as an analogy to think about what's in a child's backpack and every week, each successive week, term and year, what are we putting into that child's backpack at subject level? And it's really helped us to understand what we mean by content and concept when we design our curriculum and when we enact it. And so for us, knowledge and skills are just a first step in a much deeper process that's about the wider purpose of education, as we've talked about before. And this links to our aim of education. We think a lot about self-agency and we might have used terms such as self-efficacy or resilience. But self-agency is really important for us when we talk about the active states of being where the children take their understanding of being a scientist, a historian, an artist in their academic learning to a much deeper level, where they try to understand who they are, how the world works, and what they can do proactively to make it a better place. And we reference this as our loftier goals. We're very, very interested in what remains for children and students when they move through each stage of learning into adulthood. So much like this image of a drought-ridden rose garden, many, many years ago, which is exposed, and you see the patterns of the garden, we're very interested in the knots that are tied at subject level at different stages of learning and wider learning and those threads and what they will take with them so they can be active agents in the world. And the question when we think about curriculum at subject level and a wider level is therefore, what will we include and why and what order will it be in? And with this in mind, we really continue to exploit our 3 to 19 position as a trust chair because we build up from the, from the bottom. We're really lucky to be able to think about our curriculum like the Eiffel Tower. What's at the bottom? What's the next stage? And we deliberately work with teachers and leaders at all levels across year groups and phases to understand what has gone before and what will come next. And as we publish, train and develop, we focus on the concept of sequencing and progression so that teachers become active agents too thinking about exactly how at subject and pedagogical level something should come next and what that will look like. And we show this through the idea of vertical strands. We talk about sense of self and sense of place that enables us to continue our focus on the point of every subject and its position, position in the curriculum, but also as part of the development of the child alongside their oracy, their reading, their writing and their reasoning. And obviously, we want to blend those things together to inform each other. We know that reasoning isn't just about mathematics. It is relevant to understanding history and science. And without reading, we cannot access the work of other subjects and the other strands. Without oracy and writing, we can't interact with others or explain our learning and move forward. And this is about developing teachers for us as well. We're particularly proud of our work where we think about the importance of subject and what does it mean to be a teacher of history, geography, arts. So we pursue the notion of the subject expert, exploiting why many people become teachers, not just because they want to be social agents, but often because they also have a desire to share a subject passion. And we want our children and students to be scientists, geographers, linguists. And we want teachers and leaders to explicitly model and articulate what that state of being looks like. And a helpful thing for us when we've talked about this is the concept of communities of practice. It's been key for us. We have subject networks that bind and support specialist subject teaching together. 
even for those colleagues who might not have this as their first area of expertise. So these communities of practice are led by our trust subject experts who plan and facilitate the curation of our subject curriculum. And not only do the communities develop their curriculum in line with our trust values, but they also develop themselves as expert subject teachers, thinking about the best application, the sharing of success, and the illustrating of best subject pedagogy for each other. And this is about understanding our subjects at a very, very deep level, not just identifying whether we teach this book or that, or this episode of history or that one, but understanding how the choice is part of developing self-agency for our young people enables them to do this. We want them to grapple, to debate and to make a difference, not just to know some content. And this is never more important than now. Our curriculum conversations are always grounded in what matters now. But at this moment, as we think about how we provide for children, it would be easy for teachers and leaders to feel terrible panic and confusion. And that isn't the point of our curriculum, of course. We're very interested in, in what matters most in terms of recovery, but also in terms of subject. And our challenge is using deep subject expertise we've developed and our sequenced progressive curriculum to do this. What matters most at subject level and this is about empowering teachers and leaders across our trust as experts. These are the people who can fine tune, articulate and pinpoint exactly what our children need to do at subject level as part of their recovery. Which is, of course, this. At this moment in particular, our loftier goals are key and we want our subject curriculum to be linked to the recovery curriculum in a very deep and meaningful way. We want our subject teachers and our trust experts who lead the different subjects across, across our, our trust, we want them to be articulating what does it mean to be human? What does it mean to live in the world now and the potential future that our children and students need to feel so they can help shape it in the future? And so Helen's outlined for you the ways that we've worked uh, with our curriculum development across the trust over time. Um, and the concept of empowering those experts and the trust and collaboration work providing a platform is absolutely central to our work and becomes even more key in a post-pandemic world when thinking about recovery, rejoining and working together. The way that we work together in the trust to provide a platform and to support uh, collaboration and empowering teams and individuals is even more pertinent when we think about a recovery approach, uh, the landscape means that children will need something very individual and yet we want to make sure that there's equity riddled through that post-pandemic recovery curriculum. So we've really tried to think about a graduated child-centered approach and to think about what is it that every child will need across all of our schools, so very much that holistic thinking, but also what will be the, the deep therapeutic aspects of the curriculum development that we go into as we move into the next phase. So we've taken our inspiration from the recovery curriculum work um, from Barry and have uh, taken the different five levers and have worked them through our own curriculum and, and married them up with our own curriculum. And that's taken the form, first of all, of dwelling upon the think piece in the first place and then creating a think piece of our own that we published um, and that was then um, has been picked up and, and thought through and, and we've taken time to pick it up and think it through across our trust and within the leadership of our trust. Um, and we've we've now scoped out how we think um, the recovery curriculum touches and and shapes and changes the curriculum that we were already working on as a trust, and how it will help us to bring us back to the place that um, that we left off when we went into lockdown, essentially. But actually, not just that place, the the, the new place, the better place that we uh, are aiming to to reach in terms of self agency for our students. So, in terms of scope. Um, there's a range of things in scope. First of all, it's, it's our strategic thinking and planning as leaders. So we work together as a trust um, and we are, we are communities within that trust. So we have um, agreed together that our strategic planning over the next, um, certainly the next year, but probably um, more like the next three years, is going to be underpinned um, by our understanding of um, these elements of recovery. And then just as the recovery curriculum uh, is different for every um, school and every child, while we have come up with a strategic thinking together, actually the outworking of that, the enacting of that curriculum will be different in every school, in every classroom um, and for every child. But the kind of the key underpinning things are whole school culture. Um, and um, we've, we're thinking through and rethinking how things like assemblies work, how 
circle time and tutor times work, for example, and how they build a whole school culture that is um, right for recovery and reconnection and reignition of learning. We're focusing on what staff awareness um, of the issues is and um, shaping mindsets and developing behaviours amongst staff and particularly focusing on our shared language and making sure that we uh, have that attention to detail in terms of the language we use and in terms of being um, sensitive and insightful about the language used by our students and by those around us. There's, there's the, the social and emotional talk curriculum, those set pieces of PSHE and RSE that are, that are one way of, um, of diverting and creating our curriculum. Um, and then there's the more, the slightly more fluid um, opportunities for student voice. So there's those that are structured and those that are um, much more organic, um, where we can pick up from our students actually what should the next steps be, both for them, for their, for their class and for their school. There's subject level curriculum aspects. So, um, looking together at our subject curriculum, curricula and determining, well, what is the shortest path to learning now? What do we need to take out of the curriculum that we had originally planned and, and, and what it's, what stays? What are the key points? And how do we in ensure that the fastest route to learning is taken, for example, with the, with the key, um, steps? And similarly, within subjects, um, where, where are there opportunities for subject based therapeutic input? Um, where are the opportunities for us to use our subjects as the therapy? And then beyond that, where we need it and where students need it, where, what are the, the absolute therapeutic inputs that they will need? And not everybody will need um, every element, but some students may need a whole range of different things, counselling, talking therapy, play therapy, a, a whole range of different things. So in terms of our trust-wide approach, we have um, audit tools and we have different frameworks that we work to. We have our own existing systemic um, student voice, people voice, um, we have a whole suite of different resources um, that we can share and that we can draw upon. We've got really well-established networks, both leadership networks and subject-specific le- networks. We have our own access to other therapies um, and links with our own um, mental health and well-being strategy. So throughout um, our, our trust, we already have um, a range of different things that can be used with the leaders and as part of them. And the recovery curriculum work that we've done to date has helped shape our thinking about about these and particularly within this time. And that brings us back to our heart values. Um, if we go back to our core values as a trust, uh, it's the, the ways that we're working now, um, enlightened by the thinking on recovery, are helping us to live out those core values for our children day to day. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a blog that I wrote. I was really inspired by the work of the recovery curriculum. Um, and Barry's article, but then also um, the think piece that Sally followed up and mentioned earlier. And I wanted to really think about the concept of through the eyes of the child and and write something that fellow educators could engage with to think about the particular aspects of student voice we want to consider. And here I'm talking, I guess, about authentic student voice and and, student voice in the moment. So for me, it's about provoking uh, the students to to speak and giving them something to talk about. And I think that's really important that as educators, we're used to finding a hook. Um, and in particular, the use of humour I talk about in my blog as a way to support students to find something that they can engage with and, and talk with other students and uh, teachers about. Uh, the other thing is about promoting the positives and promoting the experiences of home and the way of life that we've developed through this pandemic and giving students the opportunity to celebrate those things. And I think it, you know, it reminds me about, about reframing and those approaches to reframing points of view. And I think that's really important. The other thing uh, I think we need to do as well, and probably more importantly than anything else is provide the space Um, And obviously within the five levers, we talk about the space and time required for students to to share what they want to share. Um, And I think within the space that we carve out uh, in the day to day experience of the students, we need to listen first and foremost and give them that space. So in my blog, I talk uh, a little bit about some of the reasons why we need to listen to the students, but I also like to give some uh, practical examples that colleagues and fellow educators can think about in terms of enacting some of these strategies in practice. So first of all, I talk a lot about how you greet the students and set the weather. And, you know, we talk at Broad Oak about how adults set the tone, adults set the weather and how we greet students when they return in whatever kind of shape or form that is at a key worker hub or within a bubble is really important. Um, safety can be fun 
Uh, and health and safety can be fun. And it's about making sure that we have a safe space that isn't devoid of all fun. So one of the things that can be a talking point can be actually, yes, we need to talk about social distancing, but let's think about the way that we can do that in a way that uh, is kind of child friendly. And so that's part of part of the strategy too. And within that, we need to lighten up a little bit as, as adults and remember that actually uh, we're dealing with children who, um, you know, they we're used to being able to communicate with students on their level, but actually more than ever, we need to be humans uh, and listen. Um, and giving students something to talk about is really key as well. Um, so I talked about giving students topics to discuss and uh, provoking that discussion. And I think it's really important that we, we give young people uh, opportunities to speak in, in an authentic way. And the last aspect that I wanted to discuss with you and, and talk about really was uh, an experience that we had in one of our uh, bubbles at Broad Oak. And it was an experience really about how authentic student voice can be uncomfortable. Um, and that sometimes when we listen, students don't always say the things we want to hear. Um, so we had an experience where we had a student who found social distancing really, really tricky. Um, and we had to find the hook. We had to find a thing that worked for this young person who was expressing, you know, not, not kind of backwards and coming forwards about uh, actually expressing his voice, but expressing his voice in a way that we perhaps as educators found, found difficult, struggling to accept social distancing, struggling to accept the kind of new, the new way of, of being. And the image on the screen is a poster that uh, we found on Twitter. And this student went from being very um, challenged by the, the new space to hooked in, excited, interested, and able to make a decision um, without uh, a kind of needing to be guided much further by adults that although 9.6 pencils is roughly two meters, he would go with 11 pens because that was probably safer uh, for him. Okay, so um, one of the key principles for us in designing our curriculum right across the trust has been a phrase that we coined a couple of years ago um, around curriculum curation and a very deliberate and intense in, in, intent choice of language there around um, what, what it means to curate a subject. And again, never has that been more true in terms of thinking about a recovery approach and a rejoining approach. We, are, we have tried to look to experts within the trust and beyond the trust and use that thinking uh, and those examples and that narrative and that, the language that other people are talking through and place our curators in a position where we're able to describe what a really great quality approach to recovery, rejoining and beyond would look like. So we've taken the idea of Agents of Hope from Andrew Moffat. We've looked to Mary Meredith for the idea of developing emotional contagion. And we spoke with Barry Carpenter about the fact that teaching is a relationship-based profession. And those key language structures have been useful to us in describing with our curators to the rest of the team across the trust what it is we're trying to achieve with these opportunities. Okay, I'm going to talk to you now a little bit about our approach at Walls Court Farm Academy, which is one of the primary academies, and how we are interpreting the recovery curriculum this post-pandemic time. Um, and for us, right the way through this period, we've felt it has been really important for our community, for our families, for our children, to maintain a sense of consistency, connection and community. So the provision right the way through from the distance learning opportunities that we've provided so far going forward has been no different to trying to maintain that sense of ethos throughout. So one of the most important questions for us is what has lockdown been like for families and learners? And we've looked at that through um, three different sort of strands. One of those is rejoining that idea that we're coming together in a physical sense. Um, you know, we have the safety aspects of learning together in school. It's a time for observation, reflection, planning, and then that idea of reconnecting, reconnecting with each other on a relational level, building those social connections, replenishing the social capital of the learners and their families. But then also a third strand, which is recovery, which is delving a little deeper into recovery from any trauma, bereavement, anxiety, 
that has arisen from this time and which would be a um, more a holistic approach. So thinking about how we've approached this at Walls Court Farm, we've taken the thinking behind the recovery curriculum and the five losses that Barry and Matthew have talked about um, alongside obviously our understanding about you know Maslow's hierarchy of needs and that idea to be safe, secure, loved before you can go on to do any successful learning and growth. So the idea of loss of routine of course has significant impact and the effects of which for some families may have resulted in disrupted sleep patterns, the ability to have rest and respite time, um, particularly for families in our community who are perhaps living in perhaps more busy, complex lives. Um, the idea from having respite for the learners coming into school from that complex home environment could be quite significant indeed. Obviously, loss of structure uh, comes underneath the same umbrella of, as that. And we understand that anxieties impair the child's ability to to learn appropriately the child's ability to deal with their, um, their coping mechanisms and that leads us then to thinking about the loss of friendship which obviously has significant impact on the support structure that children have in school the social structure and their their own developing sense of themselves the fact that the interactions that they have on a daily basis with their peer group the back and forth which provides them that self-reflection, their, their self-reflection back from their peer, peer group. And one of the things that we're very mindful of is the huge disparity between the children that are in our schools, learning in hubs and bubbles, and the children that are still learning from home. Um, and how do, we, how do we bridge that gap during this transition period? How do we facilitate the social interactions safely and at distance? Um, how do we bring groups together, share and celebrate learning and recognise individuals and prepare for rejoining? Loss of opportunity is perhaps less obvious for some, um, but for some could have more significant impact. For example, in our school, um, we have been open for seven years. So this would have been the first year where our learners would have launched themselves from being for the last seven years the oldest in our in our school, the trailblazers, if you like, of our school going forth into their key stage three experience. But for them, the loss of opportunity of being able to close and have and celebrate this ritual from going from key stage two to key stage three is really difficult. They're going forward on the back foot, feeling possibly underprepared, anxious, and really being pushed forward without even having closed the door here. So we're very aware of how that could impact in terms of emotional well-being, depression, withdrawal, etc. Quite literally, the kind of metaphorical milestone rugs have been pulled right from underneath of them. Of course, loss of freedom is something that was talked about as well which is a little bit, little more elusive and abstract and possibly more damaging for those families that we talked about coming from more complex circumstances, perhaps young carers needing that emotional respite, the demands on single working parents, larger families, and the risk of fractured relationships and emotional dis distress. So turning our thoughts to mechanisms for recovery, to counter these losses, we have thought about how important it is to rebuild and invest in social capital, to rebuild connections, trust and a sense of belonging for each member of the community, to build back and re-establish the culture and ethos for learning at Walls Court Farm, but also for all the important emotional climate of the school and the wider community. We've also thought about at Walls Court what a great opportunity this is. For a time where physically we've been disconnected with families, actually what we've found is that that's brought us closer together. And that's something that is really powerful. And we're one, you know, that idea of connecting in a more meaningful and empowering way going forward. 
So how do we combat those losses and in address the anxieties and grief that have been felt? Firstly, we need to look at what is understood about this period. What do children understand? There's so many questions that come to mind that could be misinterpreted by children. And for us, we want to make sure that we provide a safe place to hold these anxieties and create a, open up a dialogue so that we can respond, navigate our way through the conversation. Obviously, we all know the impact that this period will have on those particular children who are already going through therapeutic um, experiences to deal with attachment issues um, and the, the feelings of abandonment that will have been brought up for some and all children and families in a variety of ways will be significant. So moving forward, uh, we've, we've had a think about the five levers and linked that to our, our recovery plan at Walls Court. So this, this slide talks about um, it in three phases. So that idea of safety, stability, routine, re-establishing class identity, the sense of a group, the sense of a community, school values, routines, immersing children in the learning skills to be successful learners, reconnecting with the space, going through to phase two, which is around that loss bereavement, remembrance and grief, it's more of that ref reflective therapeutic time, reflecting on significant relationships, past, present and future, the loss of their learning journey, building resilience and what does that mean, emotional resilience, learning resilience, the concept of a safe space, and a, a physical space and an emotional space, moving through to Phase three, which is that re-engaging with the learning journey, the reignition of the learning journey, re-establishing a community of learners, a positive community of learners, exploring the lost learning and that idea of curriculum transparency, but being able to reframe it in a new context, understanding that we have lost learning, but we're sharing that new context and, the, and we will talk about the road to recovery and set small targets along the way rediscovering positive learning skills and attitudes and allowing children learners for space to to rebuild this learning journey in a way that's responsive to individuals so the final slide i'm going to share with you is a representation of of what that journey map may look like the merging elements of recovery and what they mean to us at walls court not finite but infinite not target set but responsive and carried out over time with the scope to pause for longer with any element or to cycle back as needed. For some learners, the elements that come together for recovery will need to be larger, of course. So this is only a representation of a journey that takes account of individual needs. The merging elements, as you will see indicated throughout, demonstrate an interconnected aspect of recovery. For example, the rejoining and reconnection elements we can see Reconnecting with families must connect and overlapped with a period of distance learning and the rejoining process, and they're both dependent on each other. Rejoining and connecting is about transition from distance learning into schools and what this period looks like. Reconnecting with families in preparation to learn more. Rejoining is as much to do with the physical logistics of safety as it is the orientation of emotional connection. Reigniting this phase and element is about re-engaging and reigniting that love of learning. That reigniting is a powerful word that describes something that's faded and become stronger. So it's about rebuilding our school culture. It's about rebuilding our relationships, that emotional, social capital climate, repairing, well-being, preparing for our learning climate. It's about reigniting the love of learning and filling up the metaphorical joy-filled bucket buckets. The observation and healing, of course, is, is what we've talked about a lot. And we know that children need to feel safe before learning can happen in that joy-filled context. So this is a time for, for adults to step back, to observe, to reflect on how children are coping after the initial stages of rejoining. But be, being immersed in these joy-filled experiences provide time for therapy, but also engagement. And of course, this is where the holistic approach to recovery comes in for that focused therapy and for that deeper long-term approaches. And then the relearning to be learners. I've put relearning because I wanted to highlight the again and again nature of 
re- retracing our steps back to relearn how we were successful learners. So reconnecting, rejoining this learning journey, focused therapeutic work, learning skills and attitudes, building back our resilience. We might find that we have to take a step back here when faced with struggles around this. This is where the curriculum transparency has a place, being open, honest, but compassionate about the lost learning, the missed opportunities, whilst looking forward to what this looks like in a new context. It's recognising gaps and setting new goals. It's about, as leaders, how we weave in that lost learning into a new context. But of course, this sits alongside, at the bottom, a ever-evolving curriculum, pedagogy and assessment framework that's responsive and robust in this post-pandemic landscape. And for us, one of the key factors here is around what we're calling those high dividend concepts, the most important concepts that are really going to make the difference in the recovery of knowledge, understanding of skills and how we need to be brave but strategic about our reasoned rationale to bring a focus on these concepts. And much like Charlotte has described, at Broad Oak Academy, we have also taken time to interpret how the recovery curriculum construct can be applied to us. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about some staff training that I led. Um, and I guess my first port of call with this was the Drucker phrase, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And I tried to think a little bit about how I could set the tone and also communicate some of the uh, the ideas that resonated so clearly with us uh, as leaders to uh, the wider staff body. And, and this training was for all staff uh, and all colleagues who work at Broad Oak. So I had a little think about how um, we're not only supporting our students to return, but we're also supporting our colleagues to return uh, return to school. And, and the idea of uh, kind of translating the five levers into an acronym or something that staff could help would help them to remember was was part of that strategy underpinning with uh, the first r that you can see on the slide which is about how recovery means something different for everyone and particularly uh, in our context we part of our uh, strategy and our ethos is around uh, challenging assumptions and i think what was really important was that when we translate the ideas and uh, the construct of the recovery curriculum to action that we make sure that we challenge the assumptions we may have made about what students have been doing in this time, but also we understand that all of us have been through uh, this this experience. And so uh, we all have different experiences to bring to bear. Um, And you can see on the screen as well, some uh, comments that staff made after the session about how that had resonated with them. And I think that's part of the journey too, is to listen to the staff and their reflections. And you can see some of those on the screen. The other thing that is really interesting is how, for all of us, we are navigating uncharted waters. We're navigating new territory. And it reminded me of uh, some work we'd previously done at Broad Oak about uh, liminality and understanding that, uh, you know, navigating the liminal space is a challenge, but that's where the breakthroughs happen. So I wanted to think a little bit about uh, how I could best support colleagues to enact a strategy that is so time sensitive. Um, colleagues are 100% behind the sentiment and, you know, they they want to do the right thing for the children. But equally, they need to know what concrete actions they can take in their particular role to enact the strategy in, in actual time. And so I had a little think about how I could link the strategy to key actions. And so the thing Things that we've done at Broad Oak in terms of steps we've taken to choose particular posters for the space that we have uh, with the children, the way we're designing our pods and the way that we're using, you know, rainbow tape and fun coloured tape rather than hazard tape. All of these things are an attempt to uh, afford and equip staff with the, the actual actions that set the tone and set the culture. So, as they navigate the liminal space, we're trying to uh, swing the next trapeze bar a little bit closer to them and support them to take the step they need to take to enact the recovery curriculum in practice. Um, And I think what's really heartening is that colleagues want to do the right thing and giving them this time to swim around a little bit in what is the recovery curriculum, what could this mean and what could this look like at Broad Oak is really key. Uh, And then us taking some initial steps to to show staff what this might look like in practice is where we are at the moment and a key opportunity as one colleague has reflected on the screen here for a really fresh start. 
So just thinking about bringing it back then to our original aims, intent and goals of the curriculum, um, really thinking about in a post-pandemic world, when referencing recovery and everything that uh, my colleagues have described, actually that sharpens the focus on children needing to know themselves and understand their place in a world, in a world where there have been you know, unprecedented change and seismic shifts actually the aims and the intent of our curriculum become even more important. Children having a really strong sense of self-agency, knowing themselves and understanding their place in the world so that they can take control of their lives now and through into adulthood. And so there's a whole range of different questions that schools and school leaders might be asking themselves in this period. Um, And we've outlined some of those questions on the screen. Um, hopefully what we've taken you through in terms of the Cabot Learning Federation approach is what what has guided our thinking, how our thinking has developed. It's developed quite rapidly and in different ways. And there are avenues that we've explored and, and closed off and there are avenues that we've opened up and, and where we're experimenting further. But what's been key to us is, is underpinning everything with our own mission and our heart values and making sure that everything that we're doing in terms of uh, awareness of recovery and in terms of um, developing recovery curriculum is in line with the curriculum that is true to us and that, that is uh, in line with our values. And in the same way as a leader um, of your school or your, your trust, your curriculum will be different to ours. Um, but hopefully some of the ways that we've worked through the thinking through ours may well help and enlighten you as you think through yours. Thank you, everyone, for that really dynamic presentation. How to sum that up? It's almost beyond words for me. There were so many powerful phrases, joyful curriculum, hard values, communities of practice, subject-based therapeutic input, curriculum creation. It went on and on and, and the examples are so powerful. But I suppose the thread that for me was teased through throughout that presentation was the through the eyes of the child that you could see in every slide how you were seeking authentic student or child voice. Um, In fact, the whole thing was just so learner-focused, even when it was something very strategic and about leadership or uh, directly a, a responsibility of teachers, you could still see that at the heart of it, in its essence, was that child. And I think to maintain that lens, that through the eyes of the child, is a very powerful thing for a team to be able to do. I suppose the example that caused me to smile, and it would because of my background, was actually the the picture we saw that you'd found on Twitter of social distancing. My guess is the student there was probably a student with autism. Um, But I just thought it utterly brilliant that you had those examples of two meters equals 11 pens and so on and so on. Um, And the way that uh, you'd thought it through shows that by taking this approach, this values-led approach that inevitably becomes personalized, actually enables you to devise individual strategies that touch that child at their point of learning need, which at the moment, in truth, could be a disengaged learner and how those simple but joyful strategies actually, which cause everyone in your school community to smile, will actually re-engage that child. We're on a journey for and with our learners to re-engage them, to bring them back to their rightful position as engaged learners. Today, you have illuminated that. You have celebrated what your children can achieve once more. And I applaud your endeavours and congratulate you all. Thank you for such a heartwarming presentation. There's no greater tribute, you know, for an author to see their work talked about, reworked and moved on even to a better place. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Thank you. Thank you for listening. You can 
Find more information about the recovery curriculum at www.recoverycurriculum.org. There's links to resources, reference materials, as well as uh, video slide decks. Barry Carpenter's webpage is www.barrycarpentereducation.com. And the homepage for the podcast is www.learningshared.org. You can email us at learningshared at theteachcloud.net or tweet us at underscore learningshared. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss an episode and please do get in touch with feedback if you'd like to either suggest a topic for a future episode or if you'd like to be involved in any way. Finally, you're welcome to join the conversation via one of our online communities of practice. We've got groups on Facebook and LinkedIn and details are on the Recovery Curriculum and Learning Shared web pages. You can search for Recovery Curriculum as a group inside Facebook. So for now, thanks again for listening. Stay safe and be well.